Welcome to another episode of Cadence Fishing TV. It's an absolutely glorious morning. It's early autumn and there's a bit of a cold snap in the air but it hasn't been a frost. All the rivers are completely flooded. There's no chance to fish the rivers today. So we've come to Packington Fisheries and one of my favourite venues which is the Broadwater Lake on their carp syndicate. Obviously I'm not going to fish for specimen carp today which is what most of the anglers that fish here are targeting. I'm going to fish for, for roach. I know this lake's got some absolutely spectacular roach sport and the fishery staff here let some match anglers come on, particularly in the winter, to target these wonderful fish. The tactics I'm going to use are going to be waggler. My main thinking with that is, we've experienced from the lake, fishing the lake in the past, I know that it's quite shallow close in, so I want to fish a bit further out into some deeper water and I want to fish with a float, so waggler is the natural method to start with. Okay, so let's talk about the wagglers I'm using today. If you're new to fishing and you want to learn more about waggler fishing, check out our basic introduction video on waggler fishing. So this is a little bit more advanced and you can see I've got a good selection of quite large wagglers here. Nearly all of them are bodied wagglers. I think perhaps body wagglers are a bit of a lost art really. Um, perhaps because the poles become so prominent, waggler fishing perhaps on lakes has declined a bit. But today, because I'm going to start off fishing around about 25 metres out, um, I'm not sure where the roach are going to be. Maybe they'll come closer during the day, but I'm going to start off fishing about 25 metres out. And I know the depth's around about eight foot. I will plumb up and I'll explain how I do that in a bit. So straight away, I need to be fishing with a float with a decent capacity. And something like this waggler, I think is going to be my first choice. That's a, a bodied waggler and it's semi-loaded. You can see the lead there that's been inserted into the body of the float. And then I've got my locking shot there, which is 3BB. Um, so obviously it's got a balsa body and it's got a peacock stem and a cane insert. And that for me is an absolutely brilliant float for fishing because it makes the job so easy in terms of achieving the distance. At the moment it's nice and flat and calm. Maybe if the wind gets up, I'm not gonna struggle to hit the distance and it's a very, very efficient way of fishing. So as you can see, a lot of my floats in my box, I keep the locking shot on, so I know exactly what capacity it is. And I'm now gonna take you through how to set the waggler up. Okay, so this waggler is actually a Drake waggler, and Drake's a brand that's been around for years, and I absolutely love their floats. They're such high quality, and I think they're the way they fish, the way they cast is absolutely beautiful. And you'll see that this loaded float's actually got a swivel incorporated into the bottom. And I'm going to utilize that. It goes against what I normally do, where I normally have a quick change adapter on the waggler. But I'm pretty confident that I'm going to be using this waggler. Um, I can change the top if I need to, which I'll show you about later. Uh, so basically I am committing to using it by using the swivel, but the big advantage is the way the float behaves when you're casting and striking. Because the float basically just collapses, it's much better than using a, a stiffer adapter in this case. Now if you just have a look at the float itself, you can see the capacity. Now if this float was unloaded, it would have a, a capacity around about 6 AAA. But as you can see here, it's got loaded 5.5 AAA plus 3BB. So I'm going to use 3BB to lock the float in position. And just incidentally, I'll mention the shot I'm using. Obviously, they've got to be non-toxic, but I'm using this, the Dinsmore Twin Cut shot, which is non-toxic, but I think it's the best out there because it's got a wonderful coating that doesn't seem to damage the line as much as some of the other non-toxic shot. So I'm simply going to trap the waggler with those BBs, I'm trying to line everything up so that it's all in the same direction. Just makes everything a bit neater. And obviously most of the time when you're waggler fishing, certainly fishing with a fixed waggler, you're putting the vast majority of the shot, the bulk shot around the float like that. Then I'm gonna 
add two number eights either side of those BBs just to lock them and then I'm going to put some dropper shot down so I'm going to do that and I'll come back to you and show you the finished rig. Okay so we've got the bulk shot which is around about 6 AA and I've got 6 number 8 shot which is going to be the shot that I'm going to utilise down the line and obviously there's different ways of doing that to achieve different types of presentation. One quick tip, I always like to put my shot on at the bottom of the line so I don't sort of bite them on in position and then you can carefully move them out the way so that they slide nicely without damaging the line and then I'll cut that bit of line off or bite that bit of line off where I've actually bitten the shot onto. Okay, so I'm going to move all those up underneath the float and I'm just going to very quickly check that the, I've got the, the float absolutely dotted perfectly because even though it's a big float I want to make sure that I'm fishing it as sensitive as possible and I can register the bite. So you can see there that with those number eight dropper shots I've only got you know a fraction of an inch showing above the surface. Okay so a question we often get asked is how do you plumb up when you're fishing with a waggler and that is important when you're fishing on a lake like this particularly if you don't know it. I've fished a lake before so I've got a fair idea but what I do is I've got all my shot including the dropper shot around the float and I'm just going to simply pinch a, a swan shot on as a plummet and then obviously cast that out to the area that I'm planning to fish and give myself a, a good idea of the depth. It's not going to be as accurate as fishing on a pole but it's going to be enough and obviously during the session we'll adjust the depth anyway to find out how best to present the bait. So with the swan shot on it's not too heavy to disrupt the flight of the float and I can get the float out to where I'm fishing and obviously if I'm not fishing deep enough that's going to pull the float under. But as you can see, I don't know if Chappie can pick up the float showing so I know that swan shot's on the bottom. And I'll just play around a little bit now to get the actual depth then I'm going to start fishing. Actually before I do start fishing I better tie a hook length on and I thought that would be an interesting thing to show you quickly. Um, I don't favour using swivels or anything when I'm waggler fishing and the hook length I'm using today is this 011 Vest Pro line. I might step up if we're really catching well but I think 011 is going to be a good compromise between obviously finesse catching roach but not being too fine and that would give me a breaking strain of around about two pound and the, the way I tend to tie nearly all my hook lengths is I don't like to do, use a, a loop to loop. I just do a figure of eight knot, which I might have to show you again in close up. But what the figure of eight knot does is, it gives me a very strong, reliable knot that is very, very neat. So it doesn't hamper my presentation in any way and I think it helps to reduce tangles. So I'm now just gonna simply tie my hook onto that and to start with, I'm going to go with a, a 16 carbon match, Drennan carbon match. So again, I'm starting fairly positive. If I find the going is a bit tough, then I can always scale down to a lighter hook length and a, and a smaller hook. And I, apart from when I'm fishing on the pole, maybe when I'm bloodworm fishing, I actually prefer to tie most of my hook lengths on the bank because I can get them exactly how I want them. I can adjust the length of the line to what I want and again I've got that very very neat connection between the hook length and the main line. Well the depth is around about six foot and a good tip is just to sort of make a mental note from I like to put my hook in the keeper ring on my rod and count the guides so basically the depth is one guide before the tip section so I've got a reference to come back to if I need to later in the day and to start with I'm going to start off with a shotting pattern where I've got three number eights bulked around about half depth two number eights below 
So hopefully that little bolt will give me a registration on the float and then a nice presentation on the drop. So we'll be able to see the bites hopefully and give a nice presentation as well. But obviously as always with fishing, you've got to adjust the shotting pattern according to how the fish are feeding. But that's how I'm going to start. So let's get stuck in. So the rod I'm using today, or to start with anyways, our CR10 14 foot number one. And I like to use a slightly longer rod when I'm float fishing on lakes, particularly where it's a little bit deeper and when I'm fishing at range. It just makes the job so much easier than using a, a shorter rod. So I'll cast out to the distance that I'm going to fish and like when I'm feeder fishing, I'm actually going to clip up. So I know that I'm dropping the float in the same spot every time, even though I'm obviously going to sink the line and bring the reel back. So that's a good tip. Just ensures that I'm feeding accurately and fishing the same spot. And I, as we feed a fish and I'm lining up with a far bank marker, so I know that I can be fishing in a consistently accurate area. I'm going to just start off by putting three or four small kind of nuggets of ground bait into my swim. And I'm going to use the ground bait catapult to do that. I'm going to try and make this, the balls consistent in size. And as you can see, I've laced it with lots of feed. There's hemp, casters, and some sweet corn. So I'm just trying to hit the same spot. And hopefully this will just give me a good start by attracting some fish into the area. So I think we'll give them three to start with. My intention today is not really to lose feed. Because I'm fishing a good distance out, it'd be hard to lose feed that far out anyway. But actually, funny enough, I'm straight into a fish. I don't think it's a big fish, but that's a good sign. It's a small roach, so that fish came straight onto the balls. Oh, it's a little tiny skimmer. So I was saying about not loose feeding. I want to try and fish that distance accurately and efficiently. And also by loose feeding, I might bring the fish up in the water and I want to try and target the slightly bigger roach today. So I'd only probably consider loose feeding if I could draw the fish closer in and perhaps the going was a bit harder and I was just trying to catch on the drop as well. Hook bait to start with is double red maggot. I'm hooking them both through the tail rather than the fat end. I just find that I bump less fish by hooking the maggots that way and they don't seem to spin up as much either. And I'm just going to be quite positive and fire another ball out as well. Feed-wise, I'm putting a, a ball of ground bait out about every other cast. I'm not putting massive balls out, I'm just squeezing a, a ball with my left hand while I'm watching my float. And then it gives me the chance, if I do get a bite like that, I can strike and, and not miss it. They're a beautiful roach. And again, I've just been fishing corn. I'm having to wait a bit longer for a bite, but the stamp of the fish is really wonderful. And that fish has taken the bait really well, so they're, they're feeding really confidently. Obviously, the, the good capacity and style of the float means I can achieve the distance really easily. So I'm just doing a typical sort of overhead cast, just compressing the blank nicely by both pushing and pulling 
the handle during the cast. The float's going out to the clip and I'm just doing two or three turns to sink the line. And I actually missed a bite that time as I was firing the ball out. This style of fishing you can get through quite a lot of ground bait. But it's a really positive method and one that I really love to do. I don't do it very often now. It's a really enjoyable way of fishing. I think sometimes watching a float is so much nicer than catching fish on a feeder. And this lake's got so many memories for me. So I used to, this used to be a trout fishery and I used to trout fish here well, going back 30 years. So it's just great sitting here and remembering all the different spots that I used to trout fish. Don't know if Chappy can pick up on the float, but I've got three number eights as a mini bulk now and one number eight dropper. And it is helping to register the bites. And that's really important when you waggler fishing like this. It'd be difficult to fish with a, a much bigger bulk than perhaps six number eights. Because what you get is you get the, the bulk counteracting the, the float. And if I did want to fish with a bigger bulk, perhaps in a deeper swim, I'd probably be tempted to fish with a slider rather than a fixed float like this. So but this, this, this rig's working really well. It's easy to cast and I'm picking up the bites really nicely. This is a better fish, and I think it's a bream, which I wasn't really uh, expecting. Had five or six nice roach. Quite quickly, really, I, I changed the corn for maggot because I was just getting small roach on the maggot. Changed the corn, and I got some four and five ounce roach. And this is definitely a nice bream. Wonderful. It'd be good fun if we can get a net of those. That's a really chunky, chunky bream. I'll just try and hold him up for you. Oh, 
a beautiful fish. Got to be over three pound, maybe knocking four pound. Really heavy, chunky fish. In fact, all the fish I've caught so far have been lovely quality fish. I think a big part of it, you, you find it on these kind of syndicate carp lakes. It's not a commercial lake. The, the silver fish are here naturally. It's, they obviously get fed really well by the carp fishermen. The carp fishermen use a lot of, often they'll feed, spot out a lot of particles. And I think the, the silver fish really thrive. So it's a real treat to fish a venue like this. Yeah, we obviously stick to the corn and I'm still using a 16 carbon match. If I keep catching on the corn, I might step up to a size 14. Well, I've been catching some nice roach, but just in the last 15 minutes, the ripples got up on the lake and it's making the float difficult to see. So a good tip, rather than black out my yellow float with a marker pen, just sliding a bit of silicon tubing over the top. So that black will hopefully stand out better against the lighter ripple. And I was just struggling to spot my float a little bit then. I'm sticking with corn and I've still got the 16 draining carbon match, which for a 16 is actually quite a big hook. I think it's really a, a 14. I'm not doing anything special with hooking the corn, but what, one thing I would do is, would say is I like to try and hook it so the corn is in line. If I hooked it sideways, that's going to cause line twist for sure with my hook length. So. I'm not really burying the hook too much. The fish are feeding quite positively, so I'm just nicking it in the top like that. And I keep, I've been trying casters and maggots as well, but there's definitely a lot of smaller fish out there, and the corn has been much more selective at picking out the, the bigger stamp. Well, one thing that's definitely proven so far today is I've got to feed really quite regular. As soon as I stop feeding for any length of time, even just five minutes, I just stop getting bites. So the, the fish are really responding to the ground bait and I think there's clearly a, a big shoal of fish out there. And to keep them in my baited area, I need to keep topping up. They must be pretty much eating everything that I'm firing out very quickly. Quite often I fire a ball out get a bite almost straight away. So the fish are obviously coming to the ball, coming to the splash. And again, I, I referenced it before, but I just wonder if that's got something to do with how the carp anglers feeding lots of bait and the, the silverfish, the roach and the bream are maybe accustomed to, to homing in on it really quickly and really confidently. Depth wise, I'm fishing at the moment around about, just about six inches over depth. And that's something to bear in mind when you're waggler fishing on a big lake like this. If, if the wind does get up and the, the lake starts towing, you need to anchor the bait on the bottom a lot of the time. I think the, the corn's helping me do that with it being a heavier bait. And I'm letting the bites develop as well. So I'm not hitting all the little knocks and kind of plucks at the bait. I'm waiting for a more positive bite. Be difficult to do that with the maggot and the caster because obviously they'd probably damage the bait and that would be it, you'd miss the bite. But with the corn, I think you've got the chance to definitely leave the bait in a bit longer when you're getting a bite. Even though I'm fishing at quite long range, you might notice that I'm not really striking very hard. I'm I've obviously got quite a tight line because I'm, I'm casting feather in the line, retrieving the line back to sink the line. And really, I don't need a, 
a big sweeping strike. I think using the 14 foot number one helps because it's got a very crisp action with a nice soft tip of middle. So it's not like I need to do a really harsh strike to set the hook. It's more of just a lift really. So when you do get a nasty skim like this with the wind, it really is important to sink the line. I'm not actually using a, a sinking line as such. It's, I'm using four pound pro gold. I haven't treated it with any washing up liquid, but I think using the body loaded waggler really helps because I'm casting past my feed, the float's diving down a little bit, and then just by putting the tip under the water and retrieving the reel two or three turns, that's sinking the line nicely. I'll just try and show you the process now, so. I'm not actually feathering the line because the line is hitting the clip and I'm just sinking the line. So when I'm feeding the balls, I'm obviously firing and aiming at the float and that's after the float settled. I just got that one then. So that's once I've cast the float out, sunk the line, and then I aim the balls of ground bait at the float. And I'm trying to be as accurate as I can, but for sure it's not going to be as accurate as if you were fishing with a pole. But I don't think that's a bad thing when you're catching really well like this. There's obviously a big shoal of fish out there. And I reckon I'm probably feeding an area that's around about five meters in circumference. So what you can do is you can actually find that you can pick off fish from different parts of that area. Sometimes you'll find that bigger fish will sort of hang to the side or just past where you're feeding. And on days when you've got a strong toe, you might find that the fish are settling. I know it's not a river, it's a lake, but downstream of where you're feeding. So that's obviously where all your ground bait and feed is congregating and ending up. And you can have some really good periods of the session where you're picking the fish up in that spot. It's lovely when the, when the lake goes like this, it's flat calm again, and you can really see everything. It's a bit tricky before with that ripple. A bit tricky to spot the bites and keep everything nice and tight. But I think this has got to be one of my favorite types of fishing on the lake, fishing with a float. It's just such a pleasure watching the float and catching such beautiful fish like these roach. Right then, so as the session's progressing, I'm actually going to try and put into practice what I was saying. So I'm going to cast this time a little bit to the left of the feed area. So I've probably gone two meters to the left. I'm still going to feed where I was and I'm going to see if I can pick up a better fish because that's often the case. Now I'll just add a I did have a bite straight away just as I was forming the ball, so I'll just put it back out again. I'm selecting a medium sized piece of corn. That sun feels good. It's actually quite a chilly wind this morning. So there we are again, that's about two metres to the left of where I'm feeding. And I've got a bite. Is it any better? It might be a bit better. But I've done that in the past and you sometimes pick up a bonus bream or some really nice roach. I've caught roach in here nudging two pound. They actually haven't 
managed to catch a two pounder yet, but I know they're in here. I think the carp anglers catch them quite regularly, and even on big baits like boilies. But look at that, absolutely pristine roach. Well, I was just reminiscing with Chappie about going up and fishing this style of float, bodied wagglers at long range, catching roach and bream. And I think really it's almost a bit of a forgotten art nowadays, probably because of the popularity of, of commercial fisheries where the pole often dominates and you're catching great weights of carp and silverfish at close range. So I definitely think it's a method that's worth considering and as I've mentioned before it's just such an enjoyable method. Perhaps I would have caught on the pole today but I know it's quite shallow so by consistently feeding that area around about 25 meters out we've got a really good shoal of fish feeding now and I do think on bigger lakes like this it's a, a very viable method. Obviously the feeder would be another Another important method to consider, but for me, that I think the float and fishing like this is certainly on a pleasure session, just so much more enjoyable. Well, I mixed up a lot of ground bait because you do get through quite a lot when you're fishing this style. Now, I mixed it up last night and the actual mix itself is 50% brown crumb and 50% of this pro-natural bream. I love this ground bait, it's got a lovely sweet smell, a vanilla smell, and obviously I love using brown crumb as well because it bulks out the mix, it's obviously cheaper, I buy it in the sack from Lanes in Coventry, and it also achieves exactly the kind of consistency I want when I'm firing balls of ground bait out on the float. I don't want the balls to be too heavy, to sort of crash into the water, so I want, I want the ground bait to land with a nice plot rather than a big badoosh, don't want to scare the fish. Um, it's a lovely fluffy mix and one good tip that I've done for a long time is when I mix the ground bait I add molasses to the water when I mix it and what that does is it just makes the ground bait a little bit stickier um, so I can for form a ball very quickly and easily. Obviously I'm feeding nearly every cast so I want to be able to just pick the ground bait up, form a ball, and then I can fire it out. So what I'm doing is I'm mixing a, a tray of this, so I'm putting a good amount of casters in. I've got some hemp as well, and I'll put a good amount of hemp in. It's obvious that the fish are feeding, I think. When you're fishing on lakes like this that are heavily carp fished with specimen anglers, they really do feed a lot of particles like this. I think the silverfish become accustomed to it and I think it's almost like ringing the dinner bell when they start spotting and firing balls out. So I kind of want to recreate that as well. And that's it. So I've got a lovely mix there of ground bait with hemp, corn and castors. Well, I know I explained the rig at the beginning of the video, but I thought I'd just summarise again um, the best float and shotting pattern today. So in around about six foot of water, I had this mini bulk of four number eights, around about three foot from the hook. And then I had one number eight drop shot, and then my hook length of around about 10 inches. One important thing to mention is you'll notice that the hook length, when I fold it back to the mini bulk is shorter, that's important. If it was longer then that would be inclined to tangle around. And as you could perhaps see in the video, this bulk, this mini bulk and dropper shot really enabled me to be able to present the bait well in terms of a nice fall, but also in a positive way and one that I could read on the tip of the float. And that again is the float. So it's a semi-loaded float, bodied waggler with a cane insert and I really think it's worth emphasizing how useful the bodied waggler is in this situation as I think it was Billy Lane said in his book you want to boss the water 
And having a float like that with a good capacity, very streamlined, cast like a dream, makes fishing at range like that today very, very easy. If I'd used a lighter float, I think I'd have struggled, particularly when the wind got up like this. So that was the number one choice today. I thought I'd show you some of my other floats as well. That's a larger version. So that's actually, I suppose, the equivalent of around about eight AAA. And I'd use that if I was fishing another distance out, maybe 30, 35 meters on a really windy day. Uh, I've got another float here that is an old pattern. It's a handmade float, which is loaded with this brass insert here. And that's a bit more of the sort of classic onion type body shape which is great when you've got an undertow and you want to get your flow out and underneath the surface skim. It's got a nice long antenna to help register the bites and also help you get underneath that surface tow. This is another favorite pattern of mine. Again, it's a Drake float. Uh, this one's a smaller capacity and it's got a more elongated streamlined body. And I use that when I'm not fishing so far out. And it's also actually a great float that I use on occasions on the river when I want to fish with a bolt waggler. That float works really well. The last one to show you is this, and this is an unloaded float. It's got a fantastic body again, so it's got a wonderful capacity. And nowadays I tend to use that when I'm fishing a slider, and I think that would make a, a great subject for another video in the future. And just in comparison against a, a straight waggler, that's a 5AA insert waggler, which I would tend to use if I was going to fish closer, maybe when I want to fish on the drop. So that's the occasion on a lake like this when I'd use a straight insert waggler. And that's actually another great float for river fishing. So obviously I've got a good selection of floats here, but I think it's worth just mentioning and emphasizing how simple that rig and setup is. I had one tangle today, uh, that's all, and the rig worked really, really well. Well, I'm absolutely loving this session. The we just had a period where it went quite cloudy and windy, which made things a bit more difficult, but we, we continue to catch some beautiful roach. Haven't caught any more bream. That big bream we had at the start seems to have been a bit of a flash in the pan. And I've had to keep feeding. I know I've already mentioned it, but that's been a really key factor today. I've got through three and a half trays of ground bait now couple of pints of maggots and two cans of corn. So it just shows really how positive I've had to feed it today. I think in a couple of months once we've had a few frosts and the temperature drops, I'd change my feeding, obviously be a bit more cautious, probably feed less ground bait and maybe loose feed a bit more as well. But this is just absolutely frantic fishing and absolutely brilliant. I know some of my friends that fish over in Ireland in the festivals. Fishing like this is still a viable method over there in matches. Obviously, you don't see it used so much at home now, but it's a method that is clearly effective. And it'd uh, be interesting to know your thoughts. Perhaps it's a method you used to use in the past and you've neglected, or perhaps you use it on your venues now. So just drop us a message on the YouTube channel or on Facebook and let us know. It'd be really interesting to hear how you get on with this wonderful method.
what a fabulous way to end a fabulous session. Well, the end of that session I've weighed in 33 pound of beautiful roach hybrids in that big bream. So it's been an absolutely spectacular session on the old school bodied waggler. Really enjoyed it. Thanks for watching.